if you're a beginner to mountaineering and all of the gear selections, route difficulty, route navigation has your head spinning, this is the video for you. Even though I have climbed most of the major Cascade volcanoes here in the Pacific Northwest, that does not make me an expert, but I'm definitely no longer a beginner. First, let's start with the fun part. Let's start with the gear. So in mountaineering, there's kind of a big five in my mind. Simply is your crampons, ice axe, boots, helmet, and then harness. When everybody thinks of mountaineering, they usually think of an ice axe. Now, what an ice axe does is allows you to self-arrest or basically stop yourself from moving in the snow. Okay, so our buddy just fell from here all the way down, could not arrest, almost into that crevasse. Now this is basically your number one survival tool when you are in the mountains besides this. This has a bunch of alternate uses as well. This part here, I believe it's called the ads, I don't have to look that up. It can be used to chip in steps if you're on a very precarious slope so you can actually step there and get your crampons in there. Obviously the tip here is going to be used for self arrest. The bottom here can be used for a self belay where you can put it straight down into the ground like that. It can also be used as an anchor so it can be used this way, it can be used as a T anchor, it can be used also to pad the lip of a crevasse to help haul people out of the crevasse easier. Now, there are a ton of different styles of ice axes in it, and usually for beginners, the first thing that they go to is that longer staff by Black Diamond, and that's the one that I had for a while, and it's pretty good for glacier travel. You can kind of use it as a walking stick, some people use it as a cane, but eventually, I, when you start to get into a little bit more technical terrain, at least like with like a hood summit or something like that i picked up this petzl summit evo that has more of a curved shaft here for better leverage when you're in the high dagger position and you're having to try and climb something that's pretty vertical some people are for and against the wrist slings i generally kind of like them just because of the fact that this did end up falling out of my hand it would still still be attached to my wrist now some people also say that if you did fall and it falls out of your hand then it's attached to your wrist but it's still flying down the mountain and could definitely impale you. So now one thing for ski tourers and something that I recently picked up was is called a whippet. And a whippet is basically a, a small ice axe attachment to the top of a trekking pole so that you don't really do that classic hosier move of bringing an ice axe for a ski tour when you actually didn't really need a full blown ice axe and extra weight. You could just get away with something that would be a little smaller like a whippet just in case there was a little bit of technical terrain. But for the most part, you know that there probably isn't going to be. It's just kind of a, a extra safety mechanism. So make sure whatever bag it is that you're gonna be using for mountaineering has an ice axe attachment specifically made for it. Forgot to say that it's really great to have these pick protectors on your ice axe, especially when you are traveling with it in your backpack. So number two is you have your boots. Now there's differences in boots, basically really in it with like the amount of stiffness in the actual boot. There's things called a three four shank boot and then a full shank boot. Full shank boot is going to be much more stiff and probably can't bend the boot. Whereas three four is, you can kind of bend the boot a little bit, but it's still very, very stiff, very much more so than a regular hiking boot. These are La Sportiva Equilibriums, and these are three-fourths shank. So they're, they can have a little bit of a bend, but again, as you can see, pretty freaking sturdy. The reason why mountaineering boots are mountaineering specific is usually because they have what's called a little crampon lip right here. So when we get into the crampons, I'll show you how that's compatible, but that's something that's super important to know. Now, the first time I ever climbed Mount Hood, I actually used regular snowboarding boots. Yes, super rookie move. And the second time I climbed Hood, I actually was ski touring up, so I had my my snowboard boots in my splitboard, but I actually changed them out into these. So my crampons fit on them a lot better. They were just a lot more stable and trustworthy in the kind of vertical terrain. Now, if you're a split boarder, one thing I recommend is getting a split board specific boot. So as you can tell here, it's got a heel welt and it's way more stiffer than a regular resort boot. These are very much crampon compatible and will do a lot better than just climbing in a regular snowboarding boot. So number three is crampons. And most likely the first crampons that you're gonna get are probably the universal style because they're cheaper than the semi-autic or fully automatic crampons. While that can be kind of good, I guess for 
less technical terrain, again, like maybe a flat glacier or something like that, you probably will eventually want to upgrade to a, at least a semi-automatic crampon. Really, the only time I would really recommend universal crampons is for something like putting them on your trail runners because you have to cross a glacier or something and it, it's not super steep or something like that. But for the most part, semi-automatic and fully automatic crampons are probably the way to go for most people. I have a pair of semi-automatic Gravel G12. So that just simply means that there's 12 points to these. When we were talking about the heel welt before, what's really important about these and something that the universal crampons are missing is this little piece back here. And again, I don't know the technical term for this, but this will then hook into that heel welt and flip up and provide a lot more secure connection than the universal crampons, which are basically just strapped on with the straps. Okay, and then we have your harness. While you can do this, you don't need a full-blown rock harness if you're gonna be going on a glacier or needing it for glacier travel in the mountains. Typically, you're gonna be using something a lot more minimal, like an actual glacier-specific harness. And as you can tell, comparing the two, the glacier-specific harness is very much more minimal, has less padding, and is just overall less weight and has less features than an actual rock climbing harness. One thing you wanna look for in a glacier travel harness is leg loops that actually come out like this. When you're putting the harness on and you have skis on or something like that as you're traveling over the glacier, you can actually just slip the leg loops on and then close them shut with the little contraption here rather than having to take your skis off and then putting your legs through the loops here. Okay, and then the last one is the helmet. This is a Petzl Meteor. Most beginners think that helmets are mainly there for in case you fall, but that's actually really not what they're meant for. I mean, yes, of course, it's gonna be great if you fall with that if, rather than not having a helmet, but if you, as you can tell here, it's actually beefed up more on the top and that's because mainly you're wearing a helmet protection from rock fall. So it's beefier at the top here to protect yourself from getting hit with a rock in the top of the head. Most beginners I see have the black diamond half dome and that's what I had until I lost it on Mount Hood. It just rolled down the mountain, which is another tip for mountaineering. Gravity is a real thing and make sure that you are securing all of your gear on the slope so that it doesn't roll down the mountain. I've lost a lot of gear by just doing that, kind of forgetting that you're on the top of a mountain and then it just flies away. Oh my God. No, dude, no, 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 no. One extra piece of gear that I just thought of is that you wanna make sure that you have a pair of gloves that are dexterous, that allow you to actually use them with them on. One pair of gloves that I recently picked up was the Black Diamond Terminators, and they've been actually really, really good. And a lot of times I will actually just run those just separately, as long as it's above 20 degrees Fahrenheit. But you wanna make sure that it's a pair of gloves that's waterproof, which is huge, but also that you can really uh, move your hands and, and finagle gear with. Now, some other things you're gonna need for mountaineering would be a rope, would be carabiners, would be pulley systems, and all this type of stuff that's not going to be in this video because this is more towards just the beginner's guide to mountaineering. But if that's something that interests you, let me know. So how to use the gear properly. What you're going to find a lot of people say, and something that I definitely agree with, is you want to take some sort of class first, whether that's a beginning mountaineering guide class or a crevasse rescue training class. I think all of those are extremely super valuable to learn from somebody that actually knows what they're doing and to also get real life practice. Now you can also sign up for an actual climb where guides typically will actually teach you these skills in the day prior to actually going on the climb. Now another local option as I live in Oregon is to join the Oregon Hikers and Climbers group, which is great because they will occasionally put on free classes. Now the other thing that you can do is to find a mentor that is well versed in mountaineering. And this is something that I've also so recently done and just going with them and allowing them to lead you through different things and just learning from them every single day is extremely, extremely important. And probably the best thing that you could actually do is subscribe, like this video, and then also hit the bell notification for any future videos. A couple other things is follow the American Alpine Club on TikTok. They're always spitting out a lot of really good tips and reviewing situations that happen that either occurred in death or serious injury so that you can learn from them. And then pick up the holy grail the Holy Bible of mountaineering, which is Freedom of the Hills. And this is a book that's always recommended for mountaineers and has all of the information that you could ever need. However, you need to be able to go out and actually practice that information. You can't just read it in the book, but it is a great supplement. So I got a question from the community about trying to pick the correct mountain to climb and how to know which ones to do. And it really depends on what mountain it is that you pick to determine what type of gear and what type of skills and training you need, because some of them might be an easy glacier climb 
time where you just need to know crevasse rescue, whereas another one could be something that actually requires you to bring two ice axes. And also really depends on the season that you're going because the season has a huge impact on what the snow will be like, which then correlates to what type of gear you also need. Some mountains you might not need an ice axe in the spring when you do it and it's really soft snow and not that vertical, whereas in the winter, you definitely need two ice axes. You wanna have progressive learning. Obviously don't go with the hardest mountain that you can find for the first time that you ever climb a mountain. For me in the Cascades, what I did was a very linear progression of the difficulty of mountains. So for somebody that is in Oregon or Washington, kind of the recommended progression that I did and that I would probably recommend to other people would be something like South Sister first in the summer, then you go on and you do Mount St. Helens in the winter, Mount Adams, then to Mount Hood, Mount Baker, and then finally Rainier. And again, know that each one of these can all become way more difficult depending on the weather and the conditions that you're doing them in. And now to find out what skills are required to actually summit this particular mountain that you're finding, there's a few resources that I really use. And number one would be Summit Post. And this is gonna give a very quick synopsis and different types of routes up a particular mountain. And we'll kind of generally show you like what types of skills and what types of gear that you need. Next site that I go to is usually Peak Bagger. And from here, again, it's really great because you can go in there and you can look at people's GPX tracks. I'll then usually import them if it's, if it's a successful summit into my Gaia and use that as my route. But again, you wanna be reading the trip reports to make sure that it's an accurate route. You wanna make sure confirming it with other trip reports and other GPX routes, but it's great to have that route in there. Because if you get off route, these mountains can be extremely more difficult because something that might be a class three climb on rock, then all of a sudden becomes a class four or class five, which is way more technical and has way more consequences than something that would be a class three, but it's because you took a right instead of a left and now you're going around the pinnacle of this summit rather than going up this extremely mellow ramp. Again, if you're in Washington, the Washington Trails Association is great to read trip reports on. And that's something again that I will do before every single mountain summit is read trip reports and see what the conditions are of the mountain to judge what gear that it is that I'm gonna be bringing. In order to keep track of all of these mountaineering goals though, you need to have some type of system to store all of your beta, which is all the information you find, your packing lists, maybe your flights, the dates you're going, the partners you wanna go with, and everything else that goes into a mountain summit, which is why I created a template on a app called Notion that will help you create and plan out every single individual goal that you have and click in there and have everything in there that you need instead of having to go to this bookmark page and that bookmark page and put it in your notes on your iPhone, but then you forgot where you put it and then you have a Google Doc with it. Instead of that, it's all in one place. So right now you can easily download it to your phone or your computer for $8. Thanks for watching the video. I think this is one you're gonna like next.